Welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay, and welcome to one of the coolest wine journeys I think I've ever done. Over the course of my wine drinking career, I've been to some great wine regions of the world, drinking Malbec in Mendoza in Argentina, traveling up to the Napa Valley in California and drinking some really big Californian reds, making my way through Europe and some of the classic wine areas, down to Australia and New Zealand and some brilliant Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. But today, I'm in one of the most exciting new wine regions in the entire world, Craig Hall Park in Johannesburg. Of course, Craig Hall Park is nowhere near one of the world's great wine regions. In fact, until recently, I had no idea they even made wine in Johannesburg, let alone a suburb not far from where I used to call home. But a number of people have told me about this cool little winery that's making some fabulous wine in a most unlikely location. So I've come around to discover a bit about it, find out who's involved, and talk to a Kiwi export called Cap. So finally, I've made my way to the heart of Craig Hall Park for a wine tasting experience I wouldn't have expected to have just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, but now I've discovered what I thought was Herikaris, because there is Greek heritage. But in fact, I've got it slightly wrong, uh, because Kath, it is Gerakaris? Ger yeah. Jericho. Jericho. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Pleasure. It's nice uh, to have you. I'm fascinated by this story, how it all came about, and the wine you make and how you do it in what's a slightly unconventional part of the winemaking world. But let's start with your story, because I understand it. Uh, bored of working in the corporate world in Auckland, you were a ski instructor and you were a dive instructor and you were all over the world. How did you end up in wine and how did you end up in South Africa? Thank you. So. Um, a long kind of convoluted um, scenario that ends up with an early midlife crisis, I think. Um, I did the skiing and I did London and as all good Kiwis do and travelled a lot through Africa um, and then went back home to be sensible and have a career and sit behind a desk. Only I'm very bad at sitting behind a desk, it's not, not me. And I think one evening um, in my flat at the time drinking a glass of something nice decided actually with my marketing, my initial marketing training, if I went and studied wine, then there'd be two opportunities, either to go into wine making um, and or growing, or go into the marketing of wine. So hopefully give me some not too unsensible, non-sensible options. So I went, to, went back to uh, university in uh, Lincoln, just south of Christchurch in New Zealand to study for a year. And then you found yourself in the wine industry and then somehow in South Africa. Now, normally we're a bit wary of New Zealanders coming to South Africa because you tend to beat us at rugby and then go home. That's, of course, changed of late and Jacinda's <laughs> now closed the border so the Springboks can't come and beat you lot. Yeah. Um, but, but how did you get over to South Africa? How did that part work out? So I'd, after travels through Africa, I'd made a few friends here and the diving that I did was in Sodwana Bay. So then I boldly um, phoned a few of them and said, listen, I've now got this qualification, but I need some experience and uh, does anybody know any winemakers? And I ended up with a harvest job at Belima, um, working for Giles Webb and uh, with Reedy Schultz. Um, obviously amazing and, and not just beautiful and amazing wines, but really great people because they taught me a lot and I kind of stayed under the radar a bit and managed to hang out there for nine months um, and then got another job with Bruce Jack down at Flagstone in Somerset West. So these are all harvest jobs. You know, I was supposed to be going around the world and experiencing different things. But um, Flagstone compared to Thelema was very different and I enjoyed South Africa at the time. Um, so yeah, I hung out for a little while and made myself busy and learnt as much as I could. Now, Thelema is well established and you're working with some great people, Giles, Rudy, uh, Bruce as well. And you're in a part of the world that we recognize as wine. And then suddenly <laughs> the story veers off ridiculously and you find yourself wine of origin Craig or Park, or not technically, but, but yeah. making the wine up here. How did you find yourself here and what made you think this was a good idea? So, <laughs> well, so after three years of being in the Cape, um, I met my now husband. He is a banker um, and was at the time, and he had come down for a wedding. So through friends we met and my job I can't uh, my, my marketing could happen up here and his job can't happen down there obviously um, so I moved up here for him and started marketing so marketing for a few little small estates friends um, up here and we 
thought, let's sort of make a barrel of wine in the garage. Um, and we, so we bought, we experimented, it was a huge experiment to bring some grapes up um, in a cold truck overnight and make them in the garage. And we got married and we had kids and did that for uh, four or five years in the garage. Um, so we sort of found our way and it was fun um, and we enjoyed it and got some friends to um, help stomp the grapes and come and press and have sort of mini harvest parties at the house. <laughs> Which is fantastic and it sounds like loads and loads and loads of fun, but it's not quite the same as having your own wine label here. What prompted you to make the decision to turn what was clearly a bit of a hobby into something slightly more than that? It was kind of, I don't think I've ever had any grand plans in my life. So it was, it evolved, it happened. Um, as I said, the transport and the logistics and everything worked. Um, and we found that we could make wine that we were happy to drink and friends were happy to get for Christmas presents. And so when the kids started to get a bit older, we thought, let's see if we can find somewhere to make it. That was a whole long process to firstly find this spot, but secondly go through um, all the, the legal um, certification, etc., etc., licensing, all of that. So I think Jarek Horace Family Wines came about because it was a family operation. I don't have, and I'm not, not interested in taking over the world and being a, a huge big winery. We really like the size that we are. I can still see the kids most afternoons. So it was a bit of a balance and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's intended to be a small, interesting, um, intimate uh, tasting room and, and a local winery. And it's got that feel and the moment you walk in, it just feels relaxed and welcoming, which is fantastic. Uh, there are probably people watching now at the moment going, sure, grapes in Joburg, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, so let's <laughs> clarify that. The grapes, of course, aren't up here in Johannesburg. Uh, where do they come from and why have you chosen the sites that you have? They come from the Swatland. Uh, we don't own the farm. I buy in from one farm, same farm every year, same blocks every year. Uh, I like Swatland wines. Um, I like the characters and the complexities. We can go through that as we go through the wines. But um, <coughs> yeah, and I so uh, and I and I like buying from one farm every year. So I get the, the obvious learning for me as a winemaker and and ability to work with the same style and the same flavor and um, build something that hopefully people recognize and enjoy. There is an offshoot of talking about wine, certainly with me, and that I tend to get a bit thirsty when I do this, so <laughs> this might be a good opportunity uh, to try. We've got uh, five wines in total, is that right? We have two whites, so two Chenin Blancs and three Syrahs. Aha, all right. Good, uh, good Swatland collection. So, <laughs> so to bring the family back into it, my daughter is Ellie, she's now 10, and my son is Thomas. So to go backwards, the, the second white is called Ellie, but in Greek, uh, and when we go to Greece, she's called Alaki because that's, she's little, she's young, it's the diminutive, so to speak, of Ellie in Greek. Um, this is the unwooded Chenin Blanc. Ah, I can see nice and pale, and this is a 2020, so this is fairly fresh. Yes. All right, so uh, a quick rider before I drink this. I'm uh, particularly interested, not just because it's such a cool and fascinating setup, uh, but also anything to do with Greek wine I'm a big fan of, because for me, outside of South Africa, it's probably, I think, the most exciting wine region in the world at the yeah. moment. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's different levels. The uh, uh, the wine that my uh, my wife's aunt's uncles make in their village is uh, a little more rustic, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but some of the stuff in places like Paros is fabulous, and Santorini, yeah. and of course, that famous Greek outpost, of Cragwell Park. <laughs> mm. Oh, Poliorea. <laughs> mm. Very fresh. Mm. Mm. That's quite nice. It, it, it's nice to have uh, most of the Shannon I drink because it's got a little bit of splash of wood in it somewhere along the way. So it's nice to just have the grapes out on their own and then seeing what carries they can bring out. Was, was that the motivation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> this is probably the wine that I tweak the most every year that I'm still, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, I do leave it in the tank, um, so, so it's not wild yeast, whereas everything else is. 
I leave it in a tank for two to three months before bottling. So it does have time on the leaves, so you are getting a bit of richness there, um, but not too much. It doesn't go through malolactic fermentation, so it still has the wonderful fresh um, acidity that we get from the Scotland often. Mm. Oh, it's, uh, it's drinking delightfully already. Yeah, thank you. Mm. And in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and at the risk of invoking a touch of hyperbole, I think it's probably the best Craig Hall Park wine I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is this, is this wine you would keep for a while, or is this to be drunk pretty it's soon? To be drunk fairly soon. I'd yeah. imagine so. Yeah. All right. Well, I shall do exactly that, and uh, <laughs> mm, and give it one from one. Uh, you've uh, you've done a lucky proud. Uh, so that's the first of your Shens. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the second one compare? What's different about it? So this juice, when the grapes arrive, everything's pressed on the day um, for the whites, both whites. This juice goes straight into oak barrels. Um, this vintage is 2019, so we had one new barrel. The other two uh, were older. It is fermented wild in the barrels. so. Sorry, the, it's, it's going to be released in the next uh, month or so. This is very long, slow fermentation um, in the barrel. Uh, malolactic fermentation goes through in the barrel as well, and it's only bottled at the end of the year. I do that because I love the complexity of barrel, matured barrel, um, fermented wines. Um, I think the breadth is of, of flavors is, is great. And it is, it's all about the texture on the palate, so the um, food wine, hopefully. Well, now, Ina, if you're watching this from Shannon Blanc, South Africa, you'll be very excited by this particular <laughs> wine. And it's one of the things I love about wine is, is this sort of comparison where you've got wines that stem from the same grape, but have headed off in such different directions. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I'd imagine that's so much fun, uh, so much of the fun of being a winemaker is finding out what you can do with the grape and what the, what mm. the journey is to be had with each vintage. Yeah, and at the risk of sounding a bit cliched, I really do enjoy um, showing exactly that. Giving people two glasses, here's the Alaki, here's the Illy. This, is being, this comes from the same farm, same grape. See the difference. This is what's happened and this is how it's happened and explaining that. Mm. Um, yeah, this mm. is actually, I quite like there's a lot of green freshness mm. in this. But also a lovely smooth rich seam going through it all yeah H out of interest how old is ellie now she's just turned 10. just turned 10. so i'm imagining she's probably going for the unwooded because it's uh, a little bit more approachable yeah <laughs> she's got a good nose actually <laughs> we're training her up slowly mm. my six-year-old daughter's already told me she's taking over daddy's wine show so Brilliant. Brilliant. she's six i'll give her another year or two <laughs> no, that's great and this, this will obviously age a lot more it will um, it will this what we've what i've found from my Swartland grapes, um, wines, particularly the whites, strangely, is that they, and the Ellie takes a couple of years to really come out and yeah. really show. So yeah. it, it's young. There is, a, there, there is a, a bit of restraint to this, you yeah. can sense will fall away once it yeah. uh, comes into its own. Yeah. Mm. Right, well, um, those are definitely the two best Craig Hall Park wines I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, so we're up, we're two down. You've just gone with with the two grapes. They're obviously great, and the Swatland in particular, they're, they're great examples. Uh, was there any other reason? Are they your two favourites? Were they the two you felt would be best to work with? They're, so probably one of our, um, our one of our difficulties is getting the grapes picked on one day and getting them into so that morning getting them straight into a cold truck. So I need to look at farms that um, logistically work for me. The farm that I'm working at with at the moment is great. Um, I would love to find some Movedra or one or two little more interesting, um, particularly earthy styles of, of grapes, um, but I haven't found logistically one that will easily work for me yet. Um, and saying that, I'm still try uh, definitely trying to take things slowly and, and um, work on what we've got. And I'm seeing the Jerichai Sassirtiko coming out in the next yeah, few I'd years. Yeah, I'd love to. Great Absolutely addition. Absolutely love to. <laughs> All right, on to our okay. Syrah. So this is the 1209. Um, this is an interesting experiment in marketing because 1209 has been on our back label for the last four years. However, nobody has a clue what it's about and this is the first time we've put it out. Uh, we are 1,209 kilometers as the crow flies 
ah. to the vineyards. Oh, brilliant. I, th I thought 1209 you were just celebrating the year Ken Forrester was born. <laughs> but, uh, that's a really cool story. Uh, did, you, did you measure that yourself? Uh, Google Maps <laughs> measured it for me. <laughs> All right. So this is unwooded. First, okay. first year I've made this. Completely 100% unwooded. It's, a, it's an unusual approach, but it's a, it does add a nice variety to what you're able to offer. And I, I think with a lot of wines I'm finding, especially the guys who are making uh, the higher end wines, they're generally there to be drunk a few years later. As you take out the wood, it can often mean this is something, especially with a red wine, I can drink straight away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I also, I've tasted a number of Swartland wines that are unwooded, whether it be the eggs that are coming out or the concrete tanks. And I think there's a, I think they're really good. I think mm. they're really interesting and I think they're um, definitely accessible early on. Um, but I love the fruit and there's a lot of um, inherent spice in these mm. grapes. Um, I it's hope just these so are more juicy, elegant. this, isn't it? It's yeah. just, oh, yeah. sort of fresh mulberries and, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so got almost that sort of young Malbec-ish feel to it, where it's, oh, yeah, yeah. it's very Moorish. Yeah, no, we're enjoying it. Mm. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And all three wines, I think if you're dropping down to Jerry Caris, as people of course can, because you are open to, to the public, mm -hmm. sit down here on a sunny afternoon in summer, uh, not everybody likes white wine, so this is a, a great red wine alternative or something. It's not too big and heavy for a, a yeah. lunch with some cheese and a good tasting. Yeah, absolutely. Lunchtime wine, Friday night pizza, um, mm. without wanting to diminish it, but you've got wine, you need wine at all different... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this could be a Tuesday morning breakfast red, yeah, really, absolutely. if you put your mind to it. Especially in lockdown. Yeah. And of course, your breakfast here is dinner time in New Zealand, so yeah. your body clock is probably telling you to have a glass of wine. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, there's the unwooded Syrah. It's uh, nothing too serious, but it's, it's really delightful. I like that as well. Uh, okay, we're three down. I'm really enjoying the wine so far. Uh, we now move on to what I'd imagine is uh, uh, the, uh, the equivalent your son has of the, the two Shannons. Yes. And... If you're here and the kids are here, be very careful you buy one each. There's, there's <laughs> big family fights as to whose wine is best or not. Okay, so my son is Thomas. This is the Tom. Um, these wines are, the Tom and the Thomas are made in very similar ways each year, each vintage. The, again, to work backwards slightly, the Thomas are the best uh, two or three, one or two um, barrels every year. And the Tom is everything else, a little bit more fruit focused, um, but still some elegant soft tannins um, on the palate. I don't go for very extracted, very heavy rich tannins, it's not mm -hmm. my style. Um, so a little bit more elegance there. Both these are young at the moment, so a little bit, a little bit closed up. Is there any Kiwi influence to your winemaking? Definitely, definitely. I grew up on New Zealand wines, which are so just occasionally when you say <laughs> New Zealand, that's when you know you've mostly, I mean, your English has come on brilliantly. Um, <laughs> mostly the accent's perfect, but occasionally that little Kiwiism just sneaks in there. So apparently if I have a glass of wine and I'm on the phone to my mother, <laughs> it comes out a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> How much wine do you make in total out of interest? We did 10 tonnes this year, so we're at absolute maximum for our tiny little winery, uh, which equates to plus minus 10,000 bottles. Okay, that's yeah. a solid haul. Yeah, it keeps us busy during yeah. harvest time. So. <laughs> well, it's basically three bottles between you and your husband each night over yeah, the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't need to sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> the odd yeah. Christmas present to people we like. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, I do like that. I'm um, going to be really interested, though, to see where that is in another couple of years. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. Just starting out, but uh, mm, loads of potential and lovely to drink already. It's, it's just, just starting to come out. The fruit's just, mm. just now. To come Sneaking out. its head around the door. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Ah, all right. Okay. Okay. Four out of four, and definitely the four best wines I've ever had in Craigle Park. <laughs> so let's go with number five. I need some competition. Keep <laughs> me on my toes. Okay. So this is the Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more serious, a little bit more complex, hopefully. Um, definitely more uh, aroma on the nose, um, mm. which is very important for me. How many vintages are we into the here, life of Jarek Harris? Here we've done four. Okay. Yeah. Um, so four or five before that in the garage at home. So <laughs> <laughs> Be quite an interesting vertical, that. Yeah, and we've got lively stock. We actually need to start doing 
doing a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe special Dan really likes wine evening <laughs> with a select group of guests. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. I'm, uh, I'm closing my eyes and I'm picturing some of the Swartland Syrah that I've had over the last few months. I've had a reasonable amount and uh, it definitely uh, hallmarks you pick up. That softness, mm -hmm. that elegance. Um, I think it's such a lovely area for Syrah at the moment and in some great hands as well, which uh, Swartland is full of great grapes and great winemakers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Definitely on the more elegant um, side of of the Swatland and South African wines. Mm. It's delightful. So where to from here? I know you said you want to maybe look at one or two other grapes. Uh, yeah. Is that sort of the extent of it? Is there a broader vision? Where would you like to go with this? Mm, no, I think um, we, we've we got unbelievable support from the neighbourhood, from Parkhurst, Craigle Park, etc. Um, and they come down for the tastings. We're busy, really busy on the weekends in particular. Um, so now the next step is to get out more into the restaurants. Um, but from a business point of view, uh, personally for the wine, just to make good wine every year and to try and step it up every year. Um, but I'm very happy with the size because we can still chat to everybody who comes down yeah. here, you know? So, yeah. Ah, it is fantastic. It's the, uh, is it the first winery in Johannesburg? It's not the very first. Um, there's certainly a number of people making in their garages. Um, the odd barrel here and there. Most of it to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> um, there was a couple call, um, who lived in, uh, they were up Ravonia Road and called Josie Wines. They have sensibly retired to their farm in Robertson because their kids, <laughs> I believe, have graduated. So. <laughs> all right, so leading the Johannesburg charge. Sorry. Is there, in closing, is there any potential, do you think, to ever have some grapes from Johannesburg? Maybe we could try. We could try. The climate's not, not necessarily, ideal. yeah, you read through the textbooks, it's, it's not going to tick too many boxes. But there is absolutely no reason why you can't transport the grapes up and do, do this up here. Well, the climate change, I was talking to David Finlayson <laughs> on the show last week and he was talking about the fact that they're planting grapes in the Eastern Cape at the moment. Yeah. So if we can have wine of origin East London, why not wine of origin Craigle Park? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's been fascinating getting to know you, getting to know your grapes, getting to know your wines and uh, seeing the story still in its early stages. I'll be watching closely, I'll be drinking plenty of it and uh, the Greek edge gives me an added smile <laughs> given my own uh, extended family. Uh, but thank you and uh, I think just lastly if, if people do want to come down here, come and visit, where do they find you, how do they get in touch? On the, on the website is the best way. All right, so you'll see the website on screen at the moment. Uh, Jericharis Vineyards, not Jericharis, as I've been practicing all day. Uh, I might have got the name wrong, but I was certainly right about wanting to come down here and visit because not just an enchanting host and great winemaker, but also some really cool wine out of the Swatland, but finding an unusual but very welcome home here in Craigle Park. Thanks for joining us on Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. And uh, next time you have the opportunity, try some Greek South African wine out of Joburg. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you.